Okay, so in this extra lecture, uh, we will tie up the loose ends uh, from the control systems analysis side of things here. Uh, the first topic I just want to wrap up is the hand plotting of uh, body plots. So we, we will continue to use the example from the code uh, and look at a slightly more complex uh, transfer function and try and break it up uh, into constant the constant part, the real zero, complex zeros, real poles and complex poles, and plot the body plots for each one of these cases individually and then put them back together. So we're going to look at the code and uh, see how to break up a generic transfer function. Okay. So the transfer function, so we, we have this uh, example, uh, I'm going to share this code with you start running the code uh, and here's the transfer function that we have so if I look at GS there's a third order polynomial in the uh, in the numerator and a fifth order polynomial in the denominator so there are three zeros and five poles right so if you look at line 12 and 13 12 and 13 are the coefficients of the the numerator and denominator polynomials respectively and use that to construct the transfer function so now as you can see this transfer function is not in factorized form so you can use the ZPK command in MATLAB uh, it's uh, the version that you need to use here is the ZPK data because uh, not only do you want to look at the transfer function you want to actually extract the data regarding the zeros, poles, and the constant, right? So if you, so that's done in line 15. So if you look at Z now, so the output of the command ZPK data is in the form of uh, the cell structure. So I convert that to the matrix structure. So that's that line right there, 16 and 17. So as you can see, there is one real zero at minus one, right? and two complex zeros or a pair of complex zeros if you look at the poles uh, there is the first one is a real pole as you can see the imaginary part is zero and there are two pairs of complex poles okay so <clears throat> if you go to the notes um, remember what we had done right this was your generic transfer function equation 40 in the generic polynomial form so you have the numerator polynomial and the denominator polynomial right you can then factorize it into product of in the numerator you have a constant times uh, these factors containing real zeros and these factors q of these factors containing complex zeros and in the denominator you have factors uh, involving real poles and factors involving complex poles right so that's what we have now here we see that there is one real zero and a pair of complex zeros and one real pole and a pair of complex poles and if you look at k there's a constant sitting there as well right so what this rest of the code does is essentially it identifies whether or not there is a non-trivial constant right as anything other than one is a non-trivial constant amplification so if it says sees that there is a constant that is not equal to one it's going to construct the body plot hand-drawn body plot for the constant function right store it and then it considers the zeros it looks at whether the zero is real or imaginary so if it, the zero is real it takes them one at a time right that's the jump parameter there if the zeros are if the zero is a complex uh, zero then it will also have its conjugate so it takes them two at a time and builds those canonical body plots right to plot the body for a real zero or the plot the body for a complex zero and keep storing them and this is a typo here it should be considered the poles um, so then you consider the poles in the same way look at the real poles 
one at a time and uh, the, the the complex poles in pairs right because that's how they appear great and then you simply put them all together initialize to zero and add the constant part add the zero part and add the pole part right and then of course you would like to compare it to the truth so you use the body command in MATLAB and feed it the transfer function that you have right and then you can compare them so uh, if you want to just look at what this transfer function looks like in factorized form there it is right you have the constant k which is 3 here 3 times s plus 1 and then this complex 0 uh, pair uh, real pole at minus 3 and then two complex conjugate factors or two, two, two com uh, factors involving complex conjugate pairs great and so we're gonna use uh, each of these to construct our hand-drawn body plot so I'm gonna run the fun uh, this code here and you see that there is pretty good match right so how these hand plots were drawn you have to go and read each of those cases in the notes the case for a constant case for a real zero complex zero real pole and complex pole right so the red is the sum total of all those uh, canonical body plots that we found uh, and put them all together by simply adding them up right and the blue is the true body plot that MATLAB has drawn right so you see that there is pretty good uh, match or pretty good agreement between uh, these hand-drawn plots and uh, uh, the true body plot and so it's you know extremely easy to play around with this you can simply change the transfer function change around the uh, coefficients maybe add an order here right and uh, and something goes wrong of course <laughs> so uh, it's this opportunity for you to go ahead and uh, debug the code uh, something didn't go right here um, if I change say the coefficient leave the order intact and just change the coefficient to see what happens uh, I'm changing around the coefficient of the polynomial uh, the, the uh, numerator polynomial and you see that you know it matches pretty well um, change around the maybe add an order here in the add a pole and it does pretty well right so th there is some little kinks there that probably need to be worked out uh, this code was uh, written uh, rather swiftly uh, so but but you get the point that uh, you take the transfer function you have break it up into its pieces in terms of constants zeros and poles and put all those pieces together using the approximations that are given to you in the notes great so please take some time to uh, play with this this is extremely important it gives you great insight into how different kinds of transfer functions behave to various frequencies uh, or input frequencies okay all right topic here in terms of tying up the loose ends with the control systems or control design is uh, root locus now the first thing that you need to note is that we did you know frequency response and we did body plots the root locus approach is a completely different approach right so we are, we are done with body plots now do not try to mix up the two things the root locus is uh, is a different uh, it, it's, it's a methodology in its own right uh, and the basic idea there is uh, to help tune the gains or actually just one game at a time of a control system so that you can move around the poles of the closed loop overall closed loop system that you're trying to control right? so what may happen is that without the controller uh, the poles of the dynamic system lie in parts of the uh, complex plane that you do not like right? and to get a particular kind of response from the system you would like the poles to be somewhere else so in order to get that done 
what you do is you tune the gain so you know you attach a controller block and then you have some gains there that can be tuned so you pick one of those gains and then tune it and as you do that tuning the poles of the closed loop system start moving around right and essentially you observe the locus of the poles as you tune the gain from zero to infinity right? so over the entire range of the gain where do the poles of the closed loop system lie so it is a more direct approach than the body plot essentially you're just uh, looking at the path traced by the closed loop poles as one gain of the control block is tuned from zero to infinity so let's kind of lay out this idea to an example uh, but first you have uh, the plant this is what you're trying to control that's in, uh, in the Laplace domain, you have the plant PS. Here's the output Y. Uh, you would like there to be a controller block. Right? And if you remember from last time, we did a unity feedback. You have a reference that you want the system to follow. Uh, compare it with the actual output get the error and the control block based on the error provides a control input right so you know from basic loop analysis that the closed loop transfer function which is nothing but the input output behavior is ys over rs this is by definition of course through your simple basic loop analysis you know that this closed loop transfer function is CS, BS, over 1 plus CS, BS. Right. Now, you want the output to behave a certain way when you provide a reference input. Right. In order to do that, this transfer function needs to have its poles in certain places. Right. So you can achieve that by tuning the C block. Right. So this is an extremely broad ranging problem because the C block can be pretty much anything, right? So we look at only certain classes of controllers here which are typically used and in the industry as you know the most common is the PID controller, right? So that's how you parameterize the controller using the P, the I and the D components and then you tune the gains of the proportional part, the integral part and the derivative part. I'm going to say it again. Keep in mind that when you're doing the root locus approach, you can tune only one of these gains at a time. Okay, essentially you can tune just one parameter at a time. Okay, so like I said, uh, you can propose you can propose the controller block to be a proportional part, right? So this will take the error and amplify it and you have the integral part okay. so that's the integral gain the proportional gain and so it will take this will take the error and integrate it as you know the integral part ensures that the system has zero steady state error and a derivative part right. 1 over s is integral times s is differentiation this is from the basic properties of the Laplace uh, transform. So the derivative part will uh, take the error and differentiate it. Right. So you see that there are three gains. Okay. Now in the root locus method, typically you can take one of these three and change them from zero to infinity, and see how the poles go from uh, move around in the complex plane as you do that. Okay. So to kind of to motivate this problem, let's like I said, let's look at an example. Right. So th this example is from the notes by Professor Barua. Uh, that's on Carmen. This is the top end of the root locus notes. Okay. So I'm going to uh, get this out. And in the example that he looks at, he has the plant as simply a double integrator. Right. So this double integration and uh, he has this controller so this is the PID uh, 
um, and uh, we want to put these two things together and get the closed loop transfer function. So GCL, if you uh, use these two expressions, the closed loop transfer function becomes So like I said, you can only tune one gain in the root locus method, right? So what we are going to do here uh, is, well, where did this B come from? Oh, so uh, the plant is B over S. Okay, that's where that B comes from. Okay, so uh, to try out the root locus method, we are going to fix KD or sorry, KP and KD. And we are only going to try and tune the integral gain. Okay? So I want to say this over and over again. It's very important to know that you cannot simultaneously change the gains, all the gains appearing in your control block using the root locus method. There might be other methods you can use, but if you want to do the root locus method, then you have to fix everything else up, have just one tunable parameter, and then observe how the poles move around as you tune that one game. Okay? So we're going to set uh, B is equal to 1 in this problem, and we're also going to set KP equal to 1 and KD equal to 1, and just, just to keep things simple. Okay, so Now, uh, we're going to go to the computer and look at four different cases. So we're going to look at four cases. Um, KP, 1.2. We just want to see first how this system responds. Here's the closed loop system. With B, KP, and KD equal to 1, we want to see how this closed loop system responds, meaning the output response to coming out of this closed loop system, when we provide a certain kind of input. right? for these various values of the integral game. Okay, so I'm going to move to the computer now. There you go. So as you can see, um, KP, KD, and B are all set to 1. I'm going to study the first case first. Set KI equal to 0.1. There's my transfer function. I just want to look at the zeros, well, the transfer function first. That that happens to be the transfer function. As you can see, uh, go, if you look at the notes, the numerator is a second order polynomial, so you have two zeros, and denominator is third order uh, with this generic PID control. Uh, that's the closed loop transfer function you get. Okay. So you see there that there is no um, unknowns here because all the gains have been set to specific values, right? Ki is set to 0.1 here. Okay, so what kind of input do we want to study? So what I'm looking at here is the reference line 23 is a sinusoidal input, right? So I want the system to follow that input. Right? And uh, so what we do is we simply use the lsim command in MATLAB, which we have talked about last time and feed it the transfer function, the reference input, and the time or which that reference is defined. 
and look at the output, right? And see what this PID controller is able to do for us. There you go. So <clears throat> KI, which is the integral gain, is 0.1, right? The blue is the reference input. We want the system to follow that. The system output is the black. So it doesn't quite follow it. Uh, you know, it, it's, I mean, it, it's anyone's, it depends on what you're trying to achieve with this. Uh, maybe this is good enough for you, maybe it isn't, right? So that's what you have with uh, KI equal to point 0.1. Well, it may be interesting actually to set all these gains to zero and so that there is no controller whatsoever, right? Maybe have a zero at the case first. KP, KD, and KI are all zero, so there is no controller, right? And um, well, KP should be set to one. Otherwise, we'll wipe out the signal. So set KP to one, so that CS block is simply one, and look at the system output with this. So there is no controller. Okay, that's what the system does without a controller, right? So clearly, having what we adding what we did is, it's you know it, it does at least it does improve the system response. So let's go back to our case one. That was case zero again. KD set to one and KI set to point one. Great. And so that's where the poles are. That's what this figure is showing. Once we put the PID controller in, uh, the, the, there are three poles, uh, they are all stable as uh, it should be, well there's no guarantee but uh, it, the poles does, do turn out to be stable in the left half plane and here's the system output which is much better than without having the control block. Okay, so next move to case 2 is 0.5 poles move around and you see that uh, initially the system uh, doesn't do that well it's worse than what we were getting with the case one but then over time maybe it does follow the reference input better go to case three there's the poles and after some time you see that the system does uh, you know the system is doing better in terms of following the reference initially it doesn't respond as well right but uh, the system overall does follow the reference better so this kind of tuning might uh, be making you you know starting to think that just keep increasing the integral gain right and the system will keep getting better so let's go to case 4 and we do that and if you look at the poles, something bad has happened here. The poles have moved over to the right half plane. And so this system, unfortunately, with the closed loop control, has become unstable. Right? As you can see by looking at the system output, it is BIBO unstable. And this particular input is getting amplified. Um, and so clearly it's not following the reference. So, uh, what this example shows us is that there is clearly a need to, oh well, uh, there, it, it is of value at least, to have a plot that shows how the poles of the closed loop system move as you tune this one gain Ki in this case, right? You can repeat this problem and fix Ki and, you know, tune the proportional gain Kp or KD and have a similar kind of uh, uh, analysis right? and so you would see how the poles of the closed loop system would move around. Okay, so let's go back to the board and try and figure out a, a methodical way of doing this. What we said was that we want to look at a more systematic manner of uh, observing how the poles move around at the, as the gain is tuned. So we're going to go back to this closed loop transfer function. Right, that is uh, the one we need to look at, and we want to see how the poles move. So the question of uh, the, the, the polynomial of interest is this right here, because the zeros of that polynomial are essentially the poles, right? So let us uh, do some algebraic uh, juggling here and rewrite this transfer function. 
as follows. So it's going to be the same thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and isolate this gain, right? Because clearly we want to study its impact on the location of the poles. So in order to isolate that part, keep that term aside and divide everything else by what, what's left over. So we're going to divide throughout the, du the, the numerator and the denominator by this part. Okay. So GCL, nothing changes, I'm just rewriting this, is B KDS square plus KES plus KI. I'm going to divide this by this part, S cubed plus KDS square plus KES. That's the numerator. So when I divide this part, you get 1 plus B or KI B over S cubed plus S squared. That's the same closed loop transfer function. Okay, so look at what has happened now. We want to observe what happens to the poles of this transfer function as you tune the gain ki. Right? This is a nice form because in this part everything is known. Remember, we had fixed b, but b is the system parameter, it's known, and we had uh, fixed kp and kd. So this part is completely known, right? And so the poles of GCL are the roots of 1 plus Ki B. Okay. Now, I like this form because uh, the gain Ki is isolated there. Uh, so what we can do is, before moving further, uh, we can write this closed loop transfer function as a numerator, that's all of that. And in the denominator, we have this desired form. So essentially, we identify this part as LS. This is the root locus form. CL with respect to the gain Ki, right? You want to draw the root locus of GCL with respect to that particular gain. And there are two things, well, besides this form that you want to extract, two other things that you need to be careful about when you get this form. Number one, LS should be completely independent of Ki, right? That's the whole point. We're trying to isolate Ki so that we can look at uh, its impact on uh, the poles of GCL. So the requirements here are that LS must not include or contain Ki. That's number one. It makes sense. What about XS? Well, we see that in this example, XS does have Ki. Right? But this part of XS, so XS is yet another transfer function. You can think of it that way. It's a Laplace transform something. It's a transfer function. So it has a numerator and a denominator. The poles of GCL will not be uh, affected by the numerator here. Right, because that stays in the numerator of GCL. The poles of GCL will, can, be affected by the denominator. Right. So make sure that the denominator of XS does not have Ki, and that's it. Right. So, so long as that is true, this part will remain constant as you change Ki. So the second requirement is 
denominator of excess must not contain um, yeah its numerator can it doesn't matter because that's not going to change uh, where the what happens with the poles of GCL as you change ki the zeros of GCL will change as well because you know if if, if, the, if ki is there in the numerator of excess and that but that's fine okay so these this is the desirable root locus form of the closed loop transfer function of GCL okay now I will highly encourage you to go back to your undergrad control systems uh, class notes and look at the rules that you use to plot and plot the root locus uh, once you reduce the transfer function to this form. Right? There are a bunch of rules that uh, you go through step by step. Um, we'll look at only two, the, the most basic ones what happens when k is 0, that's when you start plotting the root locus, and what happens at k equal to infinity, that's where you end the root locus, right? That's the complete range of the tunable parameter ki, okay? Uh, uh, but there are a bunch of other rules. We will not at all go over those rules. You will completely use MATLAB here. There's a command called R locus. And when you use this command for GCL, the input needs to be not GCL, but LS. Okay. So root locus of GCL in MATLAB is plotted using the R locus command using the input LS. And that's what happens uh, in the hand drawing rules as well. The rules of root locus are applied not to GCL but to LS, right? So determining this LS is extremely important uh, when you're trying to plot the root locus. Okay, and uh, like I said, these two rules must be followed as you try and extract that form. So, uh, like I said, we look at the two most important rules, or the, the, the starting and the ending rules for root locus of this so we have our closed loop transfer function in the root locus friendly form So the first question is, so I'm going to write ls here as some denominator and numerator nl over dl. It should not contain k. So question one, poles uh, of GCL at k equal to zero. Okay. That's where you start plotting the root locus. Okay, so like we said, poles of GCL are the roots of this equation or of that polynomial. So we have 1 plus k times dnl over dl is equal to 0. That's the characteristic equation for the poles. Or dl plus k times nl is equal to 0. Now, uh, when k is equal to 0, this part is 0. So the only way this equation can be solved is when dl equal to 0, which means that we are looking at the poles of Ls itself. Right? dl equal to 0 is the characteristic equation of Ls. When dl equals to 0, we are looking at the poles of LS. So, the poles of GCL at k equal to 0 are equal to the poles of LS. That's the starting point of the root locus plot. Okay. 
question 2. Where are the poles of GCL at k equal to infinity? Okay, so let's revisit this question. We have 1 plus k ml over dl equal to 0. So when k is infinity, right, let's kind of multiply by dl again. This is equivalent to dl plus k and l to 0. OK. So from here, it's not good to be multiplying by infinity it's good to divide by infinities, right? So I want to get KL in a division kind of form. So divide, multiply, uh, divide throughout by K, K uh, and so we get 1 over K DL plus NL is equal to 0. That looks much better. So when K is equal to infinity, this term goes away and so we get this equation must hold if we are to find poles of GCL. So that will be equal, that equation holds at the zeros of ls. Right? When nl is equal to zero, we are looking at the zeros of ls. So which means that the poles of GCL are at zeros of ls. Now this equation can hold true at other points as well. Okay. So here's what happens. Um, when k goes to infinity, there is one other case in which this equation can be true. So typically, numerate, well, not typically, always, what will happen is uh, if we, we will only be looking at proper dynamic systems or strictly proper dynamic systems such that um, the order of n is always less than or maybe equal to so that's not strictly but you know will it will never be more than the order of d right, in terms of the order of polynomials so the, the denominator of polynomial will always be a higher order okay now what that means is that as s goes to infinity this part will go to zero. Right. So we are looking at something like a multiplication when k is equal to infinity, we're looking at a multiplication of k with I mean infinity with zero. So under the right circumstances that number can be set to minus one. Right? As S tends to infinity, 1 plus k can be met because this product can be a finite number. It's a multiplication of infinity with 0 because the denominator is higher order. So that product can be minus 1. So at k equal to infinity, there is this one other option, that the poles of GCL are actually at infinity. Right? So we get that the poles of GCL either are at 0 or, 0 is not 0, but 0 is of ls, or at infinity. Right? So the root locus plots always begin, begin at the poles of ls and they either end at zeros of ls or at infinity right and you already know this when you plot the root locus uh, diagrams of transfer functions the number of poles and zeros will never match right but you you're looking at proper transfer functions so the number of poles will always be more than or equal to the number of zeros so you you, you are going to start say five 
plots of five locuses, loci. Right? Suppose there are five poles of MS. So there will be five starting points starting from each of those poles. But maybe there are only three zeros, right? Because LS is prop. So three of those five will end at the zeros, and the other two will go to infinity, right? That's what will happen. Okay. Okay, so let's go back to the computer. Okay, so let's go back to the computer now, to the notes and look at this uh, the root locus plot for our example I like this sequence of uh, plots here okay so this is uh, going back to our double integrator right and here's the location of the poles of the closed loop system when ki is 0.1 we looked at this case right there are three poles and that's where they are okay so now let's change these the ki value and you see that the poles moved right keep doing that and see that those two complex poles are going in the wrong direction right and there is a critical point right there at ki equal to 0.1 that they end up at the imaginary axis and then they cross over right and so if you took a history of all that you see that there's the locus right uh, on the left you have ki being varied from 0.1 to 0 0.2 uh, or, or 2 uh, in increments of 0.1 and you have a slightly higher resolution plot here uh, the ki values being varied from 0 0.01 so that's almost zero uh, so that would be the start of the root locus plot right what that means is that uh, you would start at the poles of LS, right? These three would be the poles of LS. And uh, go all the way up to 10 in small increments to get the entire root locus picture. So this is the code that was used here. I don't think that he used the R locus command. He, he drew this by hand. So you can simply use the R locus command and there it is, right? You can simply use the root locus or R locus command and look right down here the input to the R locus command is not G right or in, in his notation it's not HRY it is L okay and you get MATLAB gives a nice looking plot from start to finish so all th there are no zeros here in the closed loop system right so essentially all three loci uh, go to infinity great okay so the next little piece here where we're going to wrap up is we're going to make the connection now of root locus to control we have already done that through the example that we looked at uh, how the PID controller uh, can be used to get desirable system response uh, but we're going to look at it a little bit more now. Okay. So, okay, so what is the connection of the root locus to uh, control design? So go back to our closed loop system, the controller block, and output unity feedback. So our closed loop transfer function is CS, PS, 1 plus CS, PS. Right. Now we're going to look at uh, a couple of cases. The first one, when you're doing control design, if no one tells you what to do, right, you wouldn't know whether a proportional controller will be enough or a PI controller is going to do the trick or you would need a full blown PID right? you kind of get that idea with experience over time as to given a dynamic system and its behavior without the controller block right? what would work so but for uh, novices like us uh, we need to look at all three of these cases right? 
So let us begin by saying that you know, since we don't have any experience, uh, our control block is nothing but a proportional controller. And that's it. Right? It takes the error signal, amplifies it, and feeds that as the control. Right? So US is simply KP US. A proportional amplified uh, amplifier uh, controller. Well, if KP is less than one, it's not an amplification, but still, it's just a proportional uh, form uh, of controller. So, for this case, what does the closed loop transfer function look like? Well, GCL is KP ES one plus KP ES. We're trying to do root locus here, right? We want to place the poles of GCL at certain locations. And we have the root locus friendly form right away. Right? Remember, the root locus friendly form was XS 1 plus KLS. And there were only two rules, right? That LS should not contain KP, and the denominator of XS should not contain KP. That's true here, right? This is excess. The plant doesn't have KP, it doesn't know what KP is, so excess denominator does not have KP. And again, uh, LS is nothing but PS, right? And PS does not have KP. So if you wanna do a root locus, root locus of the closed loop is equivalent to our locus in MATLAB of you have to provide LS as the input which is nothing but yes now <coughs> great so uh, what would happen now is when you make this plot you can you know we'll we'll do an example when you do this plot you will see that uh, since ps is the same as ls the closed loop poles as kp is varied from 0 to infinity will go from the poles of ps to the zeros of ps right and if there there aren't enough zeros then the the remainder uh, loci will go to infinity okay so that's case one it's simply a proportional controller. <clears throat> now let us look at a PI controller. So CS is a PI controller such that CS is equal to KP plus KI over S. So now let us do the following. Remember, we have control over just one gain here, right? We cannot vary both KP and KI simultaneously. This is the biggest drawback of root locus method, right? That you have only one degree of freedom here. So <clears throat> what we can do is uh, we can simultaneously affect the proportional and the integral controller by pulling out again, pull out KP, call it K, and so you get one plus some constant k over x. It's the same thing, where kp equals k and ki is equal to k times k1. And so now what we can say is that this is the game we want to tune, k. And this part we're going to fix. So we're going to have to provide a value for k1. Okay. So now with that, the closed loop transfer function is CSPS, K1 plus K1 over S times PS over over 1 plus K1 plus K1 over S PS. Right, and again, here's the root locus friendly form so we have this as excess it's all good because its denominator does not contain k which is the gain we are trying to tune 
and here's ls. That's ls. It's not contained k at all. So our for pi controller ls is equal to one plus k one over s times ls. And therefore, in this case, when you want to plot the root locus of the closed loop root locus of GCL in MATLAB, you will say R locus one, I'm sorry, yeah, one plus K one over S times P S. Look at something interesting going on here. Well, before I state that, um, so the poles of GCL, the closed loop poles, will go from the poles of this product right, to the zeros of that product. Right? So I want to just focus on the interesting thing was, let's focus on that product. Right? What is that product? So LS is 1 plus K1S. Yes. That is nothing but this block times that block, right? Without the constant k, of course, that we are have pulled out. But that constant k is not going to, to affect either the zeros or poles of this product, right? I might as well write. Uh, so, so what I can do is I can write that the zeros of ls are equal to zeros of k times 1 plus it doesn't matter what k is k will not affect the zeros of ls and the poles of or poles of ls are equal to the poles of that right so this is cs and this is PS. So CS times PS is the open loop transfer function, right? Without the feedback. So the conclusion here is a pretty big one. With unity feedback, closed loop holds at k to 0 are equal, are equivalent, or are, are placed at open loop poles. Right? Poles of CSPS. And closed loop poles at k equal to infinity are placed at open loop zeros, i.e. zeros of CSPS or at infinity, right? Because the number of open loop poles will not match up, most likely, with the number of open loop zeros, so the remainder will go to infinity. So that's a pretty important result. Now let's go back to an example and wrap this up. Well, uh, before that, uh, I just want to add in the PID case as well. It's exactly the same. So the third kind of controller you can look at is CS is a PID controller. So you have KP plus KIS plus KD times S. Use the same trick as before have just one gain and simultaneously affect all the three elements of the controller block. So k times k1, I'm sorry, 1 plus k1 over s plus k2 times s. So that once everything is said and done, you know, you're going to fix k1 and k2 when you do the root locus uh, and only vary k. And then once you do find the optimal k, k P will be equal to K, KI will be equal to KK1, and KD will be equal to K2.
take it to. Okay? And go ahead and plug this back in, and you'll get the same result that at k equal to 0, the closed loop poles will be located at the open loop poles. Right? And at k equal to infinity, the closed loop poles will either be at infinity or at the open loop zeros. Great. So let us look at an example to wrap things up here. And what we are going to do is uh, we are going to try and get uh, the inverted pendulum to rest at uh, uh, at a unstable or you know at a position that's unnatural for it. This is not just a toy problem because you can think of the inverted pendulum as a rocket, right? And the rocket is climbing up through the atmosphere at an angle. Okay. So if this is the vertical. You would like the rocket to hold this attitude. This is exactly like an inverted pendulum. I would say that I have an inverted pendulum and I would like the inverted pendulum to hold this attitude and not fall down. So we'll have to provide a controller, of course. And so we'll, what we'll look at is we'll look at the plant. We'll model the plant. We know how to do that. Right? Uh, and uh, we will try to hold, or we'll try to get the pendulum started out here and then try and reach this state and stay there. Okay. Okay. So we'll see how a proportional controller does and how a PID controller does uh, achieve this goal. Okay, so here it is. Here's the system uh, matrix A, B, C and D. So look at what we have here. Here's the transfer function of the dynamic system. It's a second order and as you can see it has unstable poles, right? This is an inverted pendulum. It's an unstable system. Um, the C matrix is important. 1 and 0. Okay. The states are theta and theta dot if you remember. Right? So what we are saying, D is of course 0, so what we are saying is that the output Y is simply theta, right? And there is only one output. Uh, so this is a, in this case, a single input, single output system. This is a much, simple, uh, you know, much simpler example than what we are going to start looking at uh, uh, maybe starting next week and definitely the week after. We start looking at aircraft mechanics. Uh, here we are trying to control only the location uh, of the pendulum, which is a theta at a desired location, right? Uh, so the output is simply theta. <coughs> okay, and the transfer function, the open loop, tra well, the plant transfer function, uh, considering only the pendulum, is that right there. It's unstable. Okay, so what we're going to do first is we are going to look at simply a proportional controller right so right now kp is set at one so before i go ahead and pick a controller we want to look at the root locus right what would happen if you provided a proportional controller where would the poles go now if you go and look at the notes okay in the example that we've done here the detailed example is in the notes the code is not up yet uh, i'll upload that there are some requirements that we want from this uh, uh, inverted pendulum and in order to understand these requirements you will need to understand the basics of second order dynamic systems or second order transfer functions and my assumption is that you know all that so here's the here's the plant ps is 4 over s squared plus 4s minus 20 you just saw that on the command uh, command line on of matlab which is equivalent to that um, and you know that given these parameters you can compute things like percent percent overshoot settling time and the steady state error of uh, your dynamic system right I, I am assuming that you know all this stuff uh, from second order systems uh, if not 
I have uploaded notes on Carmen uh, under the title system response so it looks at system response for first and second order systems and in second order systems you will study things like you know the percentage overshoot uh, settling time the rate of uh, the, the swiftness of response uh, steady state and stuff like that so in designing the controller this is what we want there are three uh, desired uh, requirements from the dynamic system we want given a step input uh, we want the system to not exceed more than 30 percent overshoot to settle down to its desired state which is uh, that right there uh, which is you know the, the uh, away from the reference position in less than five seconds and have a steady state error of less than five percent okay so again assuming that you know how second order systems behave you can translate these requirements into locations of poles okay so here's the equations and this is what you get that you would want the closed loop poles to be located given uh, at these locations uh, given an equation 10 okay so that's these two points here the crosses that's where we would want the closed loop poles to be now as you can notice those poles are in the left half plane right this dashed line is the imaginary axis so they are in the left half plane and right now the system is unstable right there are two poles of the plant one is this cross right here which is the unstable pole and the other is right here so one is stable the blue one the green one is unstable right and we would want the system to be here okay now if you did proportional control right you already have the plant transfer function so you can use that as ls in the root locus friendly form and plot the root locus of the closed loop transfer function with a proportional controller and this is what you get right the proportional controller of the proportionally controlled closed loop has this root locus shown here so this pole will cross over into the stable region that's the good news this pole will start going towards instability but then not reach instability so with the proportional controller once you cross you know once you cross this pole over to the stable side you will always be stable right it will cross over and then go this way this will you know come over here and then go that way so once you are beyond this point you will always be stable that's the good news the bad news is that you will never be close to your desired locations right there's this gap here this gap here of the root locus that's the minimum gap between the root locus and your desired location so you can say as a compromise well uh, maybe I cannot meet the desired specifications I cannot reach these desired locations so let me just pick the gain that gives me that is the closest to this desired location right so I can the poles can actually be here and here which is the closest value right so uh, I think so when you once you do all that analysis well it looks like in the notes I abandoned that approach because the fact that it was far so you know let's pick as you can see the poles will come close to the desired poles for fairly large values of the proportional gain right you start here at k equal to zero and then you start increasing the gain and then you cross over and then you go this way right so the gain will be fairly large by the time the closed loop poles have been placed here so let's just pick a large value well let's start with kp equal to one most likely the closed loop zeros will not be stable and the system will behave extremely badly so there's the behavior of the system 
clearly it has not been stabilized right it's just going nuts okay so let's stop this we need a large gain let's just go all the way and say that the proportional gain is zero uh, 100 good okay so that's the response now it, it works the overshoot was pretty bad as you can see it shot across where you wanted it to be but then it came back and then it settles down with a steady state error right you have not been able to reach the desired location so there is some steady state error but you know it's the result is pretty decent so uh, from the analysis this is the actual system response figure one you can take a close look uh, when you run the code yourself the overshoot is pretty bad right? that's identified by the red line and then it eventually settles down after two seconds to within two percent of its steady state value and ends up with a steady state error that's the difference between the green and the pink the pink is the desired location right that's the step input um, you want it to be there and it is uh, it, it it has uh, developed a steady state error great so um, the proportional controller is okay but um, doesn't quite do what we want it to do okay so uh, what I have done then is gone all the way in and uh, used a PID controller okay now in this case uh, the problem is fairly complicated right um, because you in reality have three gains to pick and using the root locus method we can only pick just one gain so uh, what I have done in the notes I have laid out the procedure for finding the first two gains and you will need to have some proficiency in uh, root locus to be able to follow those arguments uh, and it goes back to the hand plotting of root locus right that that always comes back if you're trying to do design you better know how you actually do the plotting of these things by hand so that you can you know because it's the inverse problem right you're not given a controller you're trying to design the controller based on what you want the system to do and these inverse problems are always the hardest problems in engineering so you better know how to piece things together because you're trying to build something right so uh, and, and so that goes back to uh, the importance of knowing how to plot these things by hand and turns out there is you know j really just one condition that is relevant here is so-called angle condition for drawing the root locus right so that's what I have used here and uh, I'm going to have to refer you to your undergraduate textbook to brush up on that that's equation 17 um, <clears throat> to help us find uh, k1 and k2 in the PID controller so that that will ensure that the root locus will pass through those desired points okay so remember our desired pole locations were here and there are some other nuances here as well uh, these end up being not the real desired locations because when you added the PID controller you have changed the order of the system and it's no longer a second order system right the closed loop is sec no longer second order and these poles were picked on the assumption that the system is second order right that was true only with the proportional controller but the PID that assumption has failed but so design is always iterative this is a good first step and you use the angle condition to pick k1 and k2 make sure that the root locus would pass through these two desired pole locations once you do ensure that you draw the root locus using those values of k1 and k2 it turns out to be 5 and 6.3 right? and then pick the value of the gain k 
at which the poles will be there right the, the poles will end up at that location <clears throat> so uh, turns out that the value of k is 2.4 so let's do this we're gonna pick k1 to be 5 and 6.03 so 5 and 6 and k2 we're gonna pick to be 2.4 see what happens One of the things that uh, you will know about integral controllers it, is that it will give you zero steady state error but it will slow down the system. Right? So there is still a, quite a bit of overshoot, it's still better than the proportional controller. The good thing is that the steady state error is zero. Right? That's great. The desired location and the actual location match up perfectly. And that's simply an outcome of having an integral controller in your control box. So the, the crosses were your desired locations and the squares are the actual locations. So you see that picking these values of the gains have put, placed the, the closed loop system poles where you want them, right? But you're still not able to meet the overshoot requirement. Uh, the settling time is four seconds. That meets the requirement. Steady state error is zero. That's great. But the percentage overshoot was required to be less than 30%. Ends up being 55%. Well, that's what you get uh, because we, like I said, um, assumed that all those equations assumed that the system was second order and it's actually not, right? Okay, so uh, the notes has more detail how you can do a second iteration, right? And uh, um, I believe so go through that and you'll see that if you set k1 equal to 3 and let me do my little magic here in terms of that's the angle condition being implemented now run the controller after the second iteration and we are doing pretty well well the settling time uh, is actually better now the the simulation is slow the settling time is actually pretty good so it, this is still just 3.3 .3 seconds right so the system will well it hasn't settled yet the simulation ends at 4.16 but you see that uh, the steady state error right here is zero it does settle at 2.83 you know the settling time doesn't mean that the error needs to go down to zero settling time means that it reaches within five percent of its final value right? uh, or two percent of its final value so it has settled after 2.83 and uh, the overshoot is clearly less than 30 percent it's 21 percent so we met all the requirements and the gains turned out to be the proportional gain was 21 or tw close to 22 the integral gain was 39 and the derivative gain was 7.25 so these are not small values um, realizing these gains may be a concern you know, mathematically you can say that I want the gain to be 1 million but you have to have an actuator that implements that right so uh, small gain control is always better uh, but you know at least mathematically we've been able to solve this problem so this is uh, our discussion on root locus uh, there's a whole lot more, uh, but that's all we're going to do. Please read the notes. Uh, there's a lot of detail um, and uh, you know, a lot of nuance here. Uh, not all of it can be covered. On Tuesday, we're going to go back to our aircraft mechanics, set up the equations there, and start designing some controllers. Okay. Uh, well, before that, we're going to break our longitudinal and lateral directional 
flight into even smaller lower order systems right you remember that we had discovered some modes long uh, short period fugoid mode and for lateral directional we have the dutch roll and uh, uh, roll subsidence modes and spiral mode so we're going to break down our four orders fourth order system to two two order systems and then design controllers for them okay great thank you